Hey guys, today I'll show you a fantasy TV series named Brush Up Life. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with a girl, Asami, a 33-year-old unmarried woman led a mundane life working in a government department and chatting over drinks with her friends after work. However, one day after a deadly car accident, she died and found herself sent to a blank space with a service desk not far away. The staff in charge of reincarnation explained that she could start her next life by walking through the door on her left. Just as she was about to walk over, Asami turned back to inquire about her reincarnation conditions, hoping it would be better than her previous life. To her surprise, the staff told her that after her 33 years of effort, her next life could only be as an anteater in Guatemala. Asami thought she had misheard and asked again, but the staff explained that if she wanted to be reincarnated as a human, she needed to accumulate sufficient merits. Asami wondered if her lack of merits was due to her failure to solve problems for the public in her work, but regret was pointless now. The staff then mentioned a second option. She could choose not to reincarnate as an anteater right now and instead relive the same life with her current identity, thus adjusting her life's trajectory and accumulating more merits. Asami was pleasantly surprised to learn this. The door on the right was the one for rebirth. Without any hesitation, Asami decided to go right. The moment she opened the door, she found herself reborn as a fat baby with the memories of her previous life intact. In order not to startle her parents, she refrained herself from speaking and walking for ten months. It was only when she started kindergarten that her teacher discovered she could write like an adult, and her learning ability far exceeded that of her peers. Asami was determined to accumulate enough merits. She stopped littering and no longer picked flowers to sip their nectar as she used to do. With her grown-up mindset, she stumbled upon a secret she'd never noticed before. It turns out that her playmate Rena's father seemed to be unusually close with their teacher. She remembered from her previous life that Reyna suddenly changed her name and moved away, and their teacher disappeared around the same time. She suspected that an affair was developed between Reyna's father and the teacher, leading to Reyna's parents' divorce. That explained why Reyna moved away with her mother and the teacher was fired from the kindergarten. Determined to prevent this outcome, Asami took every opportunity to interrupt and disrupt their conversations. One day, she saw Reyna's father hand a note to the teacher. Seizing an opportunity when the teacher was out of the office, she altered the contents of the note. However, she felt this was still too risky and decided to sever their connection entirely. So she planned to send a threatening message to Reyna's father, warning him that she would expose his affair if he continued. But mobile phones hadn't been invented yet. Asami remembered a friend once taught her how to send messages to pagers using a landline. So, late at night, while her parents were asleep, she attempted to use the home phone, narrowly avoiding being caught by her father. On second thought, she decided it would be safer to use a public phone, so she headed to the phone booth in the park. After propping herself up on a book, she realized she didn't bring any money and couldn't make the call or send the message. Frustrated, she had no choice but to return home. Once home, Asami remembered her sister telling her that their father hid some secret money in his shoes. The benefits of being reborn with her memories were apparent. So she went to the shoe cabinet and, sure enough, found the hidden money in her father's shoe. She returned to the phone booth and finally sent the message she had intended to. As she was preparing to leave, a patrolling police officer spotted her. If she was taken home by the police, her parents would find out she had snuck out, which wouldn't be good. So to avoid the police, she hid under a car until the officer left, then quietly went home. After a night's work, she could finally sleep peacefully. The next day, as she had expected, Rena's father didn't linger to chat with the teacher after dropping off Rena. He left right away. Subsequently, thanks to her efforts, Rena's parents didn't get divorced, and Rena didn't move away, and the teacher didn't get fired from the kindergarten. Asami's plan had succeeded. Several years later, when Asami finally started elementary school, her studies were still a breeze. Even without attending class, she could still be the top student. Though she fantasized about a different life, it was essentially the same as her previous one. The only difference was that she now placed more emphasis on accumulating good karma. In the year 1997, a popular trend among elementary school students was to raise virtual chickens, competing to see who could grow the biggest and keep it alive the longest. Naturally, with her memories from her previous life, she had already bought a rarest virtual chicken in advance. She entrusted her virtual chicken to Shizuka, who was skilled at raising them. An unexpected discovery was that Reina, who had moved away in her previous life, attended the same elementary school as her due to her intervention in kindergarten. At school, she also spotted a couple who in the future would marry and then divorce. However, she decided not to interfere with them this time. 
Just like in her previous life, Natsuki and Miho became her friends. After class, the three of them would gather to chat about various topics. Sometimes they would even exchange pretty stickers, but not before assessing their value. Rare stickers couldn't be traded casually, unless it was for an equally valuable sticker. By the fourth grade in 1999, virtual chickens and stickers had been phased out. Girls started to keep personal record books, where they could jot down their little secrets. Asami decided that this time, she would keep hers properly and not lose it like before. Fast forward to 2003, Asami entered her rebellious teenage years. For some reason, just like in her previous life, she would inexplicably get agitated upon seeing her father. She had been rather harsh on her father in her previous life, but during puberty it wasn't just her father who bothered her, there were also the annoying teachers. During class, the teacher, Mr. Mita, caught a student passing notes. In order to put this teacher she disliked in his place, she stood up to defend the student, intending to use the teacher's own reasoning against him. To her surprise, the teacher asked all three of them to come to his office after class. This time, not only did she fail to save her classmate, she also got herself into trouble. At some point, taking photo booth pictures became popular among the girls. One day during class, Mr. Mita suddenly stopped behind Asami and pulled out the game console from her drawer. She had completely forgotten about this incident from her previous life. History repeated itself, and the game console was confiscated by the teacher once again. She never imagined that she would make the same mistake twice. Despite the memories bestowed by rebirth, the budding romance of puberty was non-existent for her this time. Looking at these naive youngsters, she couldn't feel any sense of affection. Even her old crush from her previous life no longer held any attraction for her because she found mature men more appealing. While Asami had an innate advantage in academics, things started to get tough in middle school. Some top students gradually surpassed her, and she could only manage to maintain her rank around the seventh place in the whole school. Regardless, she still got into the same all-girls high school as in her previous life, mainly because she was afraid of not making it into any other good high schools. High school life was dull for her. The girls were all about love and relationships, a wave she perfectly missed because she knew everyone would break up by graduation. In 2008, Asami successfully got into university, this time choosing the more challenging pharmacy college. Coincidentally, in the university cafeteria, she saw her ex-boyfriend from her previous life, Masaru. In this life, they were not in the same department, so they didn't know each other. But in the previous life, they were very much in love, only breaking up two years after graduation. The reason was that Masaru became addicted to gambling and often skipped class. After graduation, his work was unstable, frequently changing jobs. After borrowing 50000 from Asami, he disappeared into thin air. Therefore, in this life, she planned to let their paths cross without interaction, hoping that both of them could find new places to belong. During the university holiday, her good friend Miho passed her driving test as planned and bought a car. Both Asami and Natsuki were amazed at how much Miho had changed. Previously confined to her hometown, now with a car, they could take trips to nearby cities. At the coming-of-age ceremony, Asami saw the same guy causing trouble on stage and being dragged away as before. After the ceremony, they attended a middle school reunion where they saw the once handsome classmate had turned into a big fatty. It seems that history certainly hadn't changed its course. Among them, Shun was the best singer. Everyone adored him and thought he should pursue a career in music. Infected by everyone's enthusiasm, Shun promised not to let them down. Only Asami knew that in the end, Shun ended up working as a receptionist at a KTV bar. His singing was only considered good among their group. Everyone said they would buy his records when he released them, but in the end, no one did. It was all just bullshit. The girls even asked Shun for his autograph, claiming it would be a priceless treasure when he became famous. However, most people didn't even know where they had put it. Asami quietly watched their enthusiastic display, constantly making sarcastic remarks in her mind, including about her past self. She wondered whether she should prevent all this. Maybe then Shun and Shizuka wouldn't have to get divorced. Just when she was thinking about how to advise them, she suddenly recalled Natsuki mentioning that Shun had a child after remarrying, which was why he gave up his dream of music and started working part-time at the bar to support his family. If she forcibly changed Shun's path now, the child might not be born. She wondered if this could harm her karma. After much consideration, Asami decided not to do anything and let things take their natural course. 
As she was nearing her university graduation, Asami successfully passed the pharmacist exam and completed many pre-employment trainings. After graduation at 26, she was assigned to a pharmacy 20 minutes from her home. The work as a pharmacist was similar to her previous life as a government employee, still a 9-to-5 job. Her main duties included picking the medication according to patient prescriptions, checking and handing them to patients, and recording the communication content. She also had to check whether the doctor had prescribed the right medicine. Sometimes when patients complained about waiting too long, Asami would have to explain patiently. Her life was as uneventful as ever. One day after work, Asami saw her middle school teacher, Mita, on the subway. The unpleasant memory from middle school prevented her from approaching him. Instead, she thought about secretly taking a picture of him with her phone to show to her friends. Suddenly, a woman on the train grabbed Mita's hand, accusing him of being a pervert and touching her sexy body. A bewildered Mita denied doing anything inappropriate, and a quarrel broke out on the subway. At the next station, bystanders pulled Mita off the train and explained the situation to the conductor. Just then, Asami remembered Miho mentioning in her past life that Mita had been fired from the school for some unknown reason. Having just witnessed the truth, Asami hurriedly got off the train to explain to the conductor that she had seen the entire incident and showed him the video she had taken with her phone. The video showed another man was the one who had inappropriately touched the woman. Upon enlarging the video, Asami was shocked to find that the man was her supervisor from her previous life. The conductor said that as long as the video was handed over to the police, the man could likely be found within a few months. But Asami mentioned that the man worked in a government department, and she had seen him when she went to process some documents. Mr. Mita, now cleared of suspicion, thanked Asami for stepping forward to clarify the facts, and quickly recognized her. Asami explained that she hadn't immediately revealed she was his former student just to avoid appearing as if she were protecting him, which Mita understood. Later, Asami saw in the newspaper that the incident had caused a big fuss. Her supervisor from her previous life had been fired by the government. Mr. Mita personally visited her, saying that if it weren't for her video, he might have been fired from the school. He also returned a game console that had been confiscated from her in middle school. Mita said he originally intended to return it to her, but forgot due to being too busy. Asami pulled out the console, surprised that it still worked. The game she had just bought and hadn't touched for a day could finally be played. However, she discovered that the game had already been completed by her teacher. At the pharmacy, there was a respected senior colleague named Toru who was meticulous in his work. However, Asami was puzzled by his habit of always being the first to arrive, but never opening the door of the pharmacy, waiting for someone else to do so and then pretending as if he had just arrived. Aside from this, he seemed excellent in all other aspects. The pharmacy was close to the place where Asami worked in her previous life, so she went there for lunch one day. At the lunch spot, she saw her colleagues from her previous life, and her emotions became complex. Before she joined their conversation, they were happily discussing romantic relationships, a topic they never used to talk about. Asami even doubted if she had held them back in her previous life. One day off, she visited her grandfather with her sister. Her sister commented on how frequently she had been visiting their grandfather lately, asking if it was because she was getting older and becoming more attached to him. The truth was, Asami remembered from her previous life that her grandfather's health was deteriorating around this time, and he passed away a few years later, so she wanted to spend more time with him now. During the visit, she saw her grandfather eating his medicine with tea. She checked his two prescriptions and realized they were from different hospitals. Mixing the medications could be dangerous. She began to suspect that this might be the reason for her grandfather's declining health. To be safe, she took the prescriptions to her pharmacy for consultation. After confirming the drugs should not be mixed, she realized her suspicion was correct. Her grandfather then got a new prescription from his doctor. Two weeks later, her mother told her that their grandfather's condition had significantly improved. Asami felt vindicated that studying pharmacy was the right choice. It was her most satisfying achievement so far. However, her happiness was short-lived. In a magazine she casually flipped open at the pharmacy, she saw a familiar figure. It's Masaru, her boyfriend from her previous life. In this life, as they had no interaction, Masaru had become the CEO of a company with a billion in revenue. She distinctly remembered that in her previous life, Masaru was a gambling addict who accomplished nothing. She even lent him 50000 
She wondered if her absence could have something to do with his success. This question bothered her for a long time. In the 33rd year of the second cycle, which also happens to be the year she passed away due to the car accident in her previous life, she remained unmarried, spending her days dining and gossiping with friends. The only difference was that this time they ran into Reyna, who had grown up. Reyna took the initiative to greet them, mentioning that she found her dream man and showed them his photo. Asami instantly recognized the man in the photo as Toru, her senior colleague from the pharmacy. She was shocked because Toru might be married, as she had once seen him wearing a ring. Reina's father had an affair when she was young, and now was it her turn? It seemed that fate had its own plans, and the destiny that was forcefully changed would return at a particular moment. Later, they went to take photo booth pictures. As they aged, they wanted to reminisce about their youth. When they arrived at the KTV, they indeed ran into Shun, whom they hadn't seen for 13 years. Asami had known this would happen, but had to act surprised. Shun arranged a large private room for them and brought in three drinks, saying it was his treat. Asami happily said it was awesome. In her previous life, Shun had treated them to fries, but they were too full to eat anymore, so Asami just stood at the door saying they were full. It seemed Shun understood her hint. Later, Asami revealed that Reina's boyfriend might be married. After a long discussion, the three women decided to call Reina and tell her directly. However, none of them had Reina's contact information. Natsuki thought of Shun, so Asami went to the front desk, and fortunately, Shun did have Reina's number. Asami took this opportunity to ask Shun how he was doing. Shun said he was doing all right, though working several jobs was a bit tiring. He was very happy, and even showed Asami a picture of his child. Asami asked if he had given up on his dream of music. Shun said he probably wasn't cut out for it, and he gave it up for his family. Asami thought to herself that maybe not changing Shun's fate was the right thing to do. After they contacted Reina, the three of them humorously rehearsed the upcoming confrontation, with Natsuki playing the role of Reina. Thirty minutes later, Reina arrived as promised. After some simple greetings, Asami revealed the situation about Mr. Toru. Reina was stunned for a second, but once she confirmed it was true, she picked up the phone and berated Toru before breaking up with him and deleting his number. The three of them applauded for her, praising Reina's decisive manner. That night, the four of them went crazy, singing for several hours. When the event ended, the four of them started chatting outside the supermarket. Seeing Reina's good mood, the three of them were relieved. As they were gossiping, Asami saw a note on the ground. She remembered that in her previous life, she was hit by a car while picking up a note, which triggered her rebirth. This time, she saw the car that hit her drive away. She jumped up happily. What was coming next was the future that she hadn't yet experienced. The four of them climbed into Miho's car and drove off. At this moment, a mysterious woman was quietly watching them from behind. The following weeks continued with their usual routine of nine to five life. The only difference was that Mr. Toru would now actively open the door himself, rather than waiting for someone else to do it first. Everything else remained the same. One day, as they were preparing to go for lunch, they noticed a film crew shooting on location. Intrigued, Asami kept looking over, spotting a celebrity among them. Absorbed in her observations, she didn't notice a truck coming her way. Her life ended once again in the same familiar manner. Exasperated, Asami found herself back at the service desk, questioning why she always died at 33. The staff explained that everyone has a period in their life when they're more likely to die, presenting a pile of data as proof. They explained that her high-risk period was in her early 30s. If she could survive this period, she could live a long life. Regret filled Asami, but it was too late for regrets. She asked if her accumulated merits from this life allowed her to reincarnate as a human now. However, the staff told her she would be reincarnated as a large-eyed bream from the Indian Pacific. Asami argued about her efforts, but the staff explained that wanting to reincarnate as a human is a human desire. In fact, animals also want to reincarnate as the same species. For example, crows want to reincarnate as crows, and cockroaches as cockroaches. Asami argued that her accumulated merits should be more than last time, and asked if the only reason she couldn't reincarnate as a human was due to a lack of merits. The staff confirmed this. Looking at the picture of the bream, she really didn't want to be reincarnated as a useless fish, especially one that could be eaten at any moment. Asami asked if she could continue to reincarnate, to which the staff replied she could. This surprised Asami, so she asked if she could keep reincarnating until she was satisfied with her life. The staff clarified that the number of reincarnations was determined by the amount of merits accumulated in the first life. Some people don't even have a chance to reincarnate once. 
When she asked how many chances she had left, the staff replied that this information was highly confidential. Deciding not to dwell on it, Asami then walked towards the door on the right, and her third life began. This round of infancy was just as exhausting as before. It was a relief when she finally started kindergarten, only to encounter a more taxing issue, the matter between the kindergarten teacher and Rena's father. It needed to be resolved once again, but she couldn't think of a better solution, so she had to replicate the same approach from the previous life. During mealtimes at home, she would look at the blue and white fish on the table, vowing to reincarnate as a human in her next life. She successfully navigated through kindergarten and elementary school. In the 14th year of her third life, her teenage aversion to her father still persisted. Conversations among friends had shifted to various TV shows and movies. This time around, Mr. Mita continued his habit of catching students passing notes in class. Undeterred by her failure in the previous life, Asami challenged the teacher's authority again. She successfully found a loophole in the teacher's argument, leaving Mr. Mita at a loss for words. She thought she had the upper hand, but Mr. Mita reminded her that he was still the teacher with the final say. After class, the three of them still had to go to the teacher's office for a reprimand. After experiencing this for three lifetimes, Asami finally realized how naive it was to reason with a teacher. In terms of her studies, because she didn't have any lofty goals, she simply let things slide, ending up ranked 13th in the entire school, which was even worse than her performance in her second life. High school ended and not much had changed by the time she started college. She still got into the same university as before, but this time she chose the literature department, just like in her first life. Her previous boyfriend Masaru was also in this department. The stubborn Asami had no intention of getting to know Masaru again, as she didn't believe that her relationship with him could bring about such a significant change in a person's destiny. She thought perhaps Masaru from the second round was just lucky. However, Masaru took the initiative to invite her to sing karaoke one day. Unable to decline his kind invitation, she went along with her classmates. Watching Masaru sing familiar songs brought back memories of her beautiful past. Since they lived in the same direction, Masaru drove her home after the event. Sitting in the car, which she was so familiar with, Asami experienced a complex mixture of emotions. Joy and sorrow flashed through her mind like scenes from a movie. Masaru, on the other hand, was curious about this girl who always remained silent and deliberately distanced herself from him. Before getting out of the car, he asked for Asami's contact information. Although they exchanged it, she thought it would be fine as long as she didn't reach out to him. However, Masaru always invited her along under the pretense of inviting many people. Asami inevitably ended up hanging out with Masaru. After a while, Masaru confessed his feelings to her. Recalling the successful Masaru from her second life, Asami thought that perhaps Masaru's destiny would be different this time. She decided to take a chance and agreed to date Masaru. For Asami, this was like rekindling a relationship after a 62-year breakup, a magical experience that transcended time and space. Although she was already familiar with her boyfriend's character and there was no novelty anymore, they still got along very well. She vowed not to let her boyfriend fall back into his gambling habit this time. Whenever she found out Masaru hadn't attended class, she would call him to find out what was going on. Upon visiting their rented place, she found garbage scattered everywhere. Asami urged her boyfriend to improve his habits. After a while, Masaru proposed a breakup, probably because he felt Asami was too strict. They unexpectedly parted ways just like that. The loneliness of their breakup hit Asami hard. People have to accept that some people are destined to remain in your heart, but not in your life. After graduating from university, Asami started working at a television station. It was her first time leaving her hometown to move to Tokyo. Her initial job involved creating large lyric posters or standing in as light substitutes. Although the work was tough, she saw it as an opportunity to accumulate good karma. Later, Asami was assigned to the drama team and became a production assistant. Her duties included guiding and caring for actors and ensuring the smooth operation of the filming site. Thanks to her work experience from her past two lives, her performance was surprisingly excellent. She got along well with an ordinary actor and they made a pact. When she strived to become a producer, she would cast him as the lead. After the first TV drama wrapped up, she took some time off. Seizing this opportunity, she went home to visit her parents. Her best friends, Natsuki and Miho, were still her closest confidants. Whenever she felt worn out from work, she would return to her hometown, meet up with her best friends for chat to relieve stress and recharge. A year or so into her job at the television station, she finally got to work on a drama that she had loved in her previous life. Moreover, the producers she worked with were top-notch in the industry. At this point, a girl greeted her. 
Asami recognized her as her elementary schoolmate, Haruka, who now worked as a makeup artist. Their unexpected reunion delighted them both, and they seemed to have endless topics to chat about. When the first episode of the drama was broadcast, as she expected, it achieved high ratings. One day, her younger sister messaged her, reminding her it was their father's birthday, and to call him. She remembered a previous life when she bought a birthday gift for her father, and on her way home, she ran into Mr. Mita on the subway. The teacher was going to be falsely accused of being a pervert, but now she was in Tokyo and had to work late into the night, unable to rush back home and help Mr. Mita. She felt helpless about the situation, but whenever she thought about what happened to Mr. Mita, she couldn't concentrate on her work. She wondered if speeding up the shooting schedule would allow her enough time to get back home, so she hastily revised it. A scene that would have taken seven takes was reduced to three. She asked Haruka to speed up the makeup process and prepared refreshments for the extras to keep their energy levels up. She even convinced the director to skip the lunch break, finish shooting in one go, and wrap up early. Actors who were due to arrive in the evening were called in early. Thanks to her arrangements, the shooting process did speed up quite a bit. However, there were still unexpected incidents. The clapperboard used on set broke down, but the cameraman suggested they could do without it, and with the director's approval, filming could continue smoothly. But then, the actors she had called in early were stuck in traffic. Asami asked the location shooting senior for advice. Luckily, there was a small road they could use, and this issue was also resolved. In the end, they completed the shooting task three hours ahead of schedule. On her train ride home, Asami recalled that she had boarded a 9 p.m. subway train that night. However, there were three 9 p.m. trains, and she couldn't remember which one that would allow her to encounter Mr. Mita. Luckily, she remembered where her teacher had boarded the train, so she decided to wait for him at the entrance of the station. During her wait, she ran into her elementary school friend Shizuka, who happened to be passing by after work. Their conversation drifted from family matters and then to having children. Asami found the conversation getting heavy. After parting ways with Shizuka, she spotted Mr. Mita not long after. She rushed over to greet him, mentioning that it had been a while and she would like to catch up. However, Mr. Mita shared that his wife was pregnant and he had to rush home, suggesting they catch up some other time. Watching Mr. Mita walked away, Asami felt desperate and decided to intervene on the train. She caught up with him, claiming she was also taking the subway and purposely led him away from the site of the impending incident. Not long after, the incident incident occurred as expected, but she had successfully helped Mr. Mita avoid it. She also managed to surprise her parents with a visit back home, bringing along a birthday gift for her father. Though she had to leave shortly after arriving, her family was pleased to see her. Fast forward five years, Asami was still working at the television station. Her work was as busy and intense as ever. During lunchtime, she would dine at a nice restaurant with an old classmate. This allowed them to chat about past anecdotes and discuss work matters. She often had to work late into the night. One evening, Natsuki rang her, asking her to look out the window. It turned out Miho and Natsuki had come to Tokyo to visit her. Asami told them they were being too extravagant, making a special trip just to see her. Natsuki explained that they both had the day off tomorrow and planned to spend the whole day sightseeing in Tokyo before heading back. Asami was delighted, but wished they had given her some notice so she could have made preparations. With only one bed, Miho suggested that they could all sleep on the floor. Asami, however, insisted on sleeping on the bed. Natsuki teased that Asami had changed since moving to Tokyo and wasn't fit to be with them anymore. Asami countered that if there's a bed, why not use it? Her friends said it didn't matter where they slept, they just wanted to be with her. Asami then asked Natsuki why she hadn't shared the snacks she had bought. Natsuki realized she had forgotten about them, so they chatted and gossiped while munching on snacks, even bringing up embarrassing stories from their past. Asami's stress and fatigue were swept away. The next morning, Asami noticed Natsuki mixing her medicine with tea. She quickly fetched some water for Natsuki, reminding her not to mix the two. Natsuki found it odd, but did as she was told. After seeing off her two best friends, Asami remembered her grandfather's situation from her past life. Taking advantage of the weekend, she rushed to her grandfather's house. Just like in her past life, she persuaded him to change his prescription. However, her sister asked her how she knew these two medicines could not be mixed, pointing out that Asami wasn't a pharmacist in this life. Asami had to make up a story, claiming that she had learned a lot about medicine while preparing for a medical drama shoot. 
When her sister asked which drama it was, Asami had to improvise, mentioning another station's show. To her surprise, their grandmother became interested and wanted to buy the DVD to watch at home. In the end, her grandfather successfully changed his prescription. Picking up a magazine from the pharmacy, she saw Masaru, who still became a successful businessman. Asami thought that if they hadn't broken up in college, things might have been different. The only variance was that in her past life, Masaru's company had a revenue of 1 billion, but in this life, it was 900 million. She couldn't help but feel a bit guilty, thinking that their two-month relationship had cost him 100 million. Two years later, Asami's efforts at the television station finally paid off. Her rich experience helped her project proposal get approved, and she could apply to become a producer. A story about rebirth was slowly taking shape in her mind. She planned to turn her experiences into a television drama. Of course, no one knew this was her story. Other producers and officials at the station criticized her story for being too flat and lacking in climactic events. They questioned who would want to watch a reincarnation story about saving people and preventing extramarital affairs. They found it strange that not much had changed in the main character's life post-reincarnation, arguing it was a waste of a chance at reincarnation. They thought the main character should have saved the world or won a Nobel Prize or something. Faced with pressure from the station, Asami had no choice but to compromise. After work, she remembered the affair between Reina and Toru. She realized that Reina and Toru hadn't reached the point in time when they met. She thought if she could prevent their meeting, it would prevent their subsequent affair. So she started calling all her classmates, asking if anyone knew Reina or Shun's phone number. But to her dismay, no one knew. As Asami was preparing to film a story about herself, she was busy planning the cast and arranging the TV program. She started communicating with many departments and sometimes had to deal with salespeople from other agencies. One month before the shooting started, she took a chance to return to her hometown to deal with the matter concerning Rena. That night, she went to the KTV where Shun worked, but he was off duty that day. A young girl was working instead. Asami introduced herself as Shun's elementary school classmate, hoping the girl could give her Shun's contact information. However, the girl, suspecting she was a troublesome customer, found an excuse not to give it. Asami flipped through her elementary school graduation photo, trying to find someone who knew Rena or Shun well. After much thought, she decided Shizuka was the most likely candidate. She figured Shizuka might have divorced Shun by now, so she called Shizuka, asking for Shun or Reina's contact information. Luckily, Shizuka had Reina's phone number. After calling Reina, Asami chatted about past memories, finally asking Reina to have dinner on April 1st. That was the day Reina was supposed to meet Toru. Reina, however, declined the invitation. Asami was at her wit's end. On April 1st, Asami simply went to the restaurant where Rina and Toru were supposed to meet. She chose a spot where all customers had to pass and sat there waiting for Rina. After consuming a large amount of food, Rina still hadn't shown up. Just as Asami was about to give up, Rina finally arrived. They both greeted each other, happy to unexpectedly meet. Rina mentioned she originally had an appointment, but it was canceled last minute so they could have dinner together. Fearing Toru might show up, Asami suggested changing restaurants. Reina disagreed, saying the food was good here. She even offered to treat Asami and reassured her to order freely. But even if she was full, Asami had to eat to help Reina avoid an extramarital affair. Just as the two were happily chatting and dining, Toru walked in. Asami quickly tried to distract Reina, especially as Toru took a seat quite close to them. In order to divert Reina's attention, Asami kept talking about amusing anecdotes from her work. They were almost finished eating, but Reina had a small dish that she was taking forever to finish, which made Asami curse in frustration. At the last moment, Toru finally noticed Reina and took the initiative to greet her. Asami, who felt her efforts were in vain, was annoyed by that. Luckily, they only exchanged a few words rather than hormones since Asami was there, putting a damper on any deeper conversation. Rina got up to get her final glass of water, planning to leave after finishing it. Asami thought everything should be fine now, only to turn around and find the two of them exchanging contact information. Despite her vigilance, they had managed to connect. By the time she got to them, it was too late. They had already traded information. After leaving the restaurant, they all went their separate ways. After pondering all night, Asami finally came up with an idea. Early the next morning, she went to the pharmacy where she had worked in her previous life. Toru was there, waiting in his car for someone to open the door, just like before. She approached Toru and went straight to the point, telling him that he was a married man and should not have improper thoughts about Reina. Toru tried to defend himself, but Asami pointed out that he was wearing a wedding ring when he entered the restaurant. However, he had taken it off when exchanging contact information with Reina. 
At this, Toru was speechless. Embarrassed and angry, he tried to dismiss her. Asami warned him that if he approached Reina again, she wouldn't let it go. Cornered, Toru promised he wouldn't contact Reina again. Before leaving, Asami said what she had wanted to say in her previous life, asking him to open the door himself if he arrived at the pharmacy earlier, which left Toru dumbfounded. The scene then shifts to Asami discussing work with her friend Haruka, only to unexpectedly discover that her friend was married. Upon receiving this shocking news, she asked Haruka when she got married and why she had no idea. Haruka explained that she got married six years ago when she started working here. She was too busy at that time and didn't have a wedding, so she didn't tell her. Asami was stunned to realize that she had been completely oblivious to her friend's marital status for the past six years. She had assumed Haruka, like herself, was too busy with work to care about personal relationships. It was a surprise to discover that someone had betrayed their collective commitment to work over personal life. Thankfully, she still had her best friends Natsuki and Miho to comfort her. Suddenly, she received a call from Shun, whom she hadn't seen in nine years. They agreed to meet at a cafe. They hadn't seen each other since their coming-of-age ceremony. Shun mentioned that he was in Tokyo for some business. Asami, aware of his divorce with Shizuka, asked how he was doing after it. Shun revealed that he was dating a woman and might start a new marriage soon. He showed Asami a picture of the woman, which surprised Asami. This was the woman she met when she went to the karaoke bar to look for Shun. No wonder she refused to give Asami his phone number last time. Afterward, Shun gave Asami his new album and encouraged her to give it a listen if she felt like it. Asami thought to herself that she hadn't had a chance to hear Shun's new songs in her previous lives and was finally able to listen to them now. When asked about his music dreams, Shun revealed that he had left his record company and was now an independent musician composing his own songs. If he gets the chance, he would like to try acting to expand his life's possibilities. If Asami's TV drama needed any minor roles, he was up for the task. Before leaving, he reminded Asami to reach out to him if she needed anything. Asami thought that she might let Shun down this time, because the casting for her TV drama was already full. That night, Natsuki and Miho came to Tokyo again. Asami complained that they visited too often. Natsuki threatened that if she complained again, they would come every night. Asami informed them that she had met Shun that day. They probably didn't know that Shun and Shizuka had divorced. It must be tough to support a family with music earnings, so Shun had mentioned wanting to try acting. Natsuki and Miho were surprised. They hadn't heard Shun was interested in acting. Shun was a big figure in their class, and it must have been difficult for him to swallow his pride and ask for help. Perhaps he was driven by life's circumstances. Thinking about their old classmate's struggles, the three of them felt sorry for Shun. Miho suggested they could buy some of his CDs to support him. As it happened, Shun had given Asami one of his CDs that day, so they decided to listen to it together. They were somewhat excited. After all, Shun was the king of song in their class. But after listening, they were stunned by his terrible singing. Asami changed the subject and brought up Haruka, who had gotten married six years ago. Asami asked why they weren't surprised. After all, the three of them were still unmarried despite being of marriageable age. Natsuki said that Haruka's news wasn't so shocking, especially after hearing Shun's song. Natsuki asked Asami to stop playing Shun's songs. Afterward, the filming of Asami's TV drama went smoothly. Although the script was based on Asami's experiences, the actual content had been changed beyond recognition. The plot had become about revenge and rebirth. The lead role was played by a celebrity actor whom Asami had known long ago. However, in the drama, another lead actor couldn't make it to filming due to a flight delay. Asami contacted the schedule staff to see if the shooting could be postponed, but she learned that his wife was leaving the next afternoon. If the two lead actors couldn't film together the next day, the following shooting schedule might be delayed, and the first episode might not air on time. Asami suggested to the director that they could film separately. They could use a stand-in for the scene where the two leads cross paths. After looking at the list of extras, she couldn't find any actor of the same height that satisfied her. That's when she saw Shun's information in her bag. His height was very suitable. Perhaps Shun could try. After that, Shun was invited by Asami. He didn't expect that the makeup artist Haruka was also a classmate. He gave Haruka a CD. After taking a few pictures and sending them to the director, Shun was allowed into the studio for filming. When shooting started, Shun perfectly performed the stand-in actor's tasks. Before leaving, Asami promised him more significant roles next time. When she was arranging a taxi for him, she found Shun had connected with the celebrity actor, even giving him a CD. Finally, the day of the first episode's broadcast arrived. Natsuki and Miho also rushed to Tokyo in the evening to watch the first episode with Asami. 
On her way home, a truck lost control and headed straight for her. Then she found herself dead and sent back to the old place again. Asami ran to the service desk to complain that she was only 29 years old. The staff responded that passing away before 33 was still possible. They then informed her that they were going to start arranging her reincarnation. Asami asked if they didn't have a TV there. She had written a ton of project proposals, finally got her script approved after months of meetings, filmed late into the night every day, and even pulled in old classmates to shoot the trailer. The editing was super exciting, and the first episode was supposed to air that day. But she died at such a crucial time. Asami asked if they could wait for her to finish watching before she died. The staff replied that they couldn't. Asami said that they rejected a dead person's wish too quickly. The staff apologized to her and said that after all, it was a TV series she had created herself. He asked her how long she would need to finish watching the series. Asami said an hour would be enough. She would be satisfied just watching the first episode. Then she asked if she could watch it now. The staff answered that she couldn't. He continued to ask her which channel was broadcasting it and who the lead was. Seeing hope, Asami asked if she could watch just 10 minutes. The staff still said no. He then asked her how many episodes there were in total. Asami wondered why he asked so many questions if he wouldn't let her watch. The staff then told her that because she had complained that he rejected her too quickly. That's why he needed to ask her more questions. Speechless, Asami asked what she could be reincarnated as this time. The staff replied, a sea urchin from Hokkaido. However, Asami believed being reincarnated as a sea urchin was worse than her previous lives. The staff gave her a photo of a cooked sea urchin. Asami asked if she could start over. Over. The staff told her she could. As she walked towards the right, she turned back and asked why she had to start from the beginning each time. It was so tiring and laborious. Asami's fourth round of life began. As a baby, she swore that this time she would give it her all. She couldn't continue living on the same track as before, or she'd truly be done when she used up all her good karma. After starting kindergarten, she not only refrained from sucking nectar herself, but also actively persuaded her classmates not to do so. She taught classmates with many toys to share with others. As for the matter with the teacher and Rina's dad, this time she decided to try a different approach. She went straight to the teacher to explain the situation and told her not to have an affair. The teacher asked where she learned all this. She said that a previous teacher had an affair, which resulted in a broken family and dismissal from the kindergarten, so she hoped this teacher wouldn't make the same mistake. Asami said that Reina's dad's phone number was on the teacher's note and told her not to contact him. The teacher was surprised to see that it really was a phone number on the note. In front of Asami, the teacher tore up the note and promised not to have an affair, reassuring Asami. Afterwards, the teacher deliberately kept a distance from Reina's dad. Asami thought to herself, if she had known this, she should have done it this way from the start. After starting elementary school, she took the initiative to greet her elders and water the plants at school. She did everything she could to accumulate merits. This time in her studies, she no longer rested on her existing knowledge, but began to learn middle and high school knowledge, studying anything she thought was useful. She didn't waste a moment of her time. However, the price she paid was that she didn't become friends with Natsuki and Miho and had to wear glasses at an early age. One day, on the way to the library, she saw Natsuki and Miho exchanging stickers in the park. Memories from previous lives echoed in her mind. She approached and asked to join their little group. Without a second thought, they let her join. Asami was moved to tears. Natsuki and Miho each gave her a sticker, and she said she would give them one each in return. However, after Natsuki and Miho saw her stickers, they each casually picked one. This makes Asami feel that they were just being polite and didn't treat her as a friend. On the way home, Miho asked Asami why she was so smart and always came first in exams. Asami said she was attending tutoring classes. As they parted, Asami watched Natsuki and Miho drift away. It felt like they were in a different world this life, and it was hard for her to fit into their circle. She felt a strange sadness. After middle school, she continued her habit of picking up trash. She was the only one going to school. Whenever she saw Natsuki and Miho, she could only give them a quick greeting before walking to school alone. Without friends, Asami put all her energy into her studies. This time, she finally ranked first in the entire school, but she was often accompanied by a sense of loneliness. 
She couldn't enjoy the happiness of this age like other students. One day she went to the place where they used to take photo stickers. Seeing Natsuki and Miho happily taking photos there, she felt a pang of jealousy. Then she heard someone calling her from behind. It was Mari, the second-ranked student in the grade. Mari invited her to take photo stickers together, which was beyond Asami's expectation. In previous lives, Mari was always the top student in the grade. The two chatted effortlessly, and they got along surprisingly well. Mari asked if she could chat with her again tomorrow. Asami didn't expect the top student like Mari could be so approachable. In fact, Mari thought the same of her. Indeed, like attracts like. Soon, she and Mari became friends. In the previous lives, Mari was always the one giving speeches on the podium. This time, the speeches were mostly given by Asami, and she even became the student council president, with Mari as vice president. They both graduated with excellent grades. This time in high school, Asami chose the best local school and maintained her status as the top student in the grade. One day, she saw a newspaper article about a medical professor who had won the Nobel Prize. Asami wondered if she could also accumulate a large amount of merits this way. So after graduating from high school, she decisively chose to attend the medical school of a national university. At the coming-of-age ceremony for the fourth time, Asami sees Natsuki and Miho once again. In this lifetime, Mari calls out to her, and they joyfully enter the venue together. The troublemaker, as always, makes his way to the podium. Asami and Mari start discussing the punishments he will inevitably face after this. Later, they attend a middle school reunion. The plot unfolds just like before, with the only difference being the addition of Mari. Seeing them praising Shun again, Asami recalls listening to records in her previous life. Mari, like Asami, doesn't believe Shun can succeed. Mari even wants to warn Shun, but Asami quickly dissuades her, fearing that it could affect the future birth of Shun's child. Watching Shun and Shizuka exchange contact information, even though she knows they will marry and divorce, Asami doesn't intervene. Back in the private room, she had hoped to catch up with Natsuki and Miho, but it ended up being an adulation, leaving her feeling very melancholic. After graduating from university, she passes her professional physician's exam. After two years of clinical research, she becomes a researcher at the National Medical Research Institute. Their work involves discovering medical phenomena not yet uncovered by humanity, contributing to the future of medicine. This job benefits all of humanity, fitting perfectly into her accumulation of merits. Asami hopes that this time she can be reincarnated as a human. Apart from work, Asami remembered the previous incident with saving teacher Mida. However, this time she encounters Shizuka again at the subway station. Shizuka chats about daily trivialities, and this time Asami supports her idea of divorce. Because they chat for too long, teacher Mida walks past them. Thankfully, Asami notices in time, and teacher Mida recognizes them both. Asami shares Shizuka's worries with the teacher, conveniently using Shizuka to keep teacher Mida occupied. Occupied. Asami suggests that they find a place to sit down and talk. Teacher Mita checks the time and decides to take the next subway home, so they find a restaurant. Teacher Mita advises Shizuka not to rush into the idea of divorce and should properly communicate her true feelings to Shun. If Shun insists on venturing into the music industry, he should agree to fulfill his obligations. As a couple, they need mutual understanding and compromise. If communication fails, it's not too late to talk about divorce. Persuaded by the teacher, Shizuka understands many things. Asami notices the change in the wind and checks the time. The subway she was worried about has already departed, so there's no need to worry about teacher Mita being falsely accused. She urges the teacher to rush for the next subway. Although the teacher wanted to continue chatting, he leaves reluctantly under Asami's insistence. Before leaving, he doesn't forget to remind Shizuka to have a proper talk with Shun when she gets home. In this way, the issue with teacher Mita is resolved. Now she needs to figure out what other problems she needs to solve. Since Asami has been so outstanding from childhood to adulthood, it finally sparks suspicion in her younger sister. She challenges Asami, asking if this is her second life. Little did she know, this is actually her sister's fourth life. Having such an exceptional sister has brought her immense pressure, making her feel that she has lived under her sister's shadow for many years. Asami tells her that her grades are also excellent, consistently in the top five of their grade. Her sister replies that having a genius sister means she doesn't know how hard it is to be a younger sister. When Asami asks what she would do if this was indeed her second life, her sister asks who she will marry in the future. Asami honestly doesn't know, because she died before her sister got married in her previous lives. As she is studying medicine in this life, she quickly solves the issue with her grandfather's prescription. But this time, she does not find any news about Masaru in the pharmacy magazine. 
Three years later, she comes to resolve the matter with Reyna. She thought this time it would be a sure thing, but she didn't expect the two to connect again, causing her to vent her anger on Toru. This time she solves the problem in a few minutes. Her work as a research assistant is confirmed, and she finally starts doing formal experimental research. The work hours are flexible as long as daily tasks are completed. Her job involves taking out the required samples and conducting various experiments. The work is both boring and monotonous, with little results shown for a long time. Fortunately, she has experience from her past lives, allowing her to cope with this job. One day, she returns home. Her father tells her that her younger sister is about to bring her boyfriend home. He discusses with her what appropriate clothes to wear, just in case the guy is coming to propose. Asami says to go natural, and there is no need for any specific outfit. Her father disagrees, insisting that it's a formal occasion. A few days later, her sister brings her boyfriend home. It turns out her sister just wanted her boyfriend to help assemble a newly bought cabinet. Their father waited for a long time until the guy left, only then realizing he had dressed up formally for nothing. Asami continues with her experiments. Sometimes, looking at these microorganisms, she has some strange thoughts. She wonders if these microorganisms are also reincarnations of others. In this life, she finally lived to the age of 35, longer than any of her previous lives. Although she didn't make any major medical breakthroughs, she published her own papers on various medical websites, contributing to the medical field. This year, her younger sister got married to the boyfriend she had brought home. Seeing her sister walk in, she was instantly reminded of their shared childhood memories, which were so warm and joyous. The idea that the little child from those days had now married stirred deep feelings within her. Back in their hometown, Asami asked her friend Mari to join her for dinner. They hadn't seen each other in quite some time, and there was a lot to catch up on. Mari had become a pilot, requiring rigorous annual physical exams. When told about this, Asami admitted that she could never meet such stringent requirements. Just then, Natsuki and Miho happened to pass by. They hadn't seen each other in over a decade since their coming-of-age ceremony. The four were delighted to run into each other and commented on how each other had changed. Asami wanted to invite them to sit and chat, but Natsuki and Miho, knowing they didn't fit in the same social circle as Mari and her, made an excuse and moved to another table. After they left, she confessed her hesitation to invite them. Mari pointed out that they may not have felt comfortable because they weren't that close. It made her realize how much their relationships had changed. She wondered whether it was the passage of time or her own choices that led to the change. Such are the gains and losses of life. Mari then pulled out an old photo booth strip from middle school, a significant memento of their first meeting. Mari confessed that she had always wanted to ask her which life cycle she was on. It turns out Mari was also a reincarnate. No wonder she had always ranked first in their previous lives. This question caught Asami off guard because she indeed was a reincarnate. She wasn't sure if she should reveal the truth. Mari admitted that this was her fifth cycle. Asami then asked Mari how she found out about her own reincarnation. Mari explained that she hadn't been such a good student before. Her sudden outstanding performance raised suspicion. Plus, during their photo booth session in middle school, she had used an odd phrase which wasn't in common use back then. Furthermore, she had mentioned a shopping mall that didn't yet exist. Because of that, she had figured it out long ago. She asked Mari why she hadn't told her sooner. Mari replied that if she had been wrong, she might have been considered crazy and lost her only friend. Asami asked Mari if she had also visited the reincarnation service desk and what she had been reincarnated as in her first cycle. Mari answered that she was a termite from southeastern Guatemala, a kind that anteaters love to eat. Mari then asked her what she was in her first cycle. Asami remembered being an anteater, the natural enemy of termites. So she stumbled over her words and vaguely said it was an animal related to termites. Mari seemed pleased with the answer, assuming that reincarnates tend to be reincarnated into similar species. She asked Mari if she chose to relive her life so as to be reincarnated as human again. Mari replied that it wasn't entirely the case. In the first cycle, Mari was just an average person with mediocre grades. She, along with Asami, Natsuki, and Miho were best friends. The four of them were inseparable in primary school, always discussing the TV dramas they invented, exchanging stickers they liked. On her birthday, the other three even gifted her beautiful stickers. They took a photo booth picture together in middle school. It was only in high school that they parted ways. Following the trends of the time, Mari became a peculiarly styled gangster girl, and her grades were disastrous. As a result, she only managed to get into a vocational school to study childcare. However, their friendships remained unchanged. Miho would take the other three on trips to other cities during holidays. 
At a middle school reunion, Mari looked at the handsome classmate whom she once had a crush on and realized the old feelings were no longer there. In her first life, Mari was actually a fan of Shun. The two even exchanged contact information and started dating a few months later. But Shun's career never took off. He was a street performer, and she was the only one willing to keep him company. Despite this, Mari felt extremely happy and was willing to support Shun for life. Hearing this, Asami was surprised that Mari had dated Shun, but she said their relationship lasted only half a year. Shun later cheated on her and they broke up. Asami asked with whom Shun had cheated. Mari said it was with Shizuka, who had wanted to date Shun since that reunion, but Shizuka didn't expect Mari had dated Shun before she could. Mari said that it was her three friends who informed her about Shun's infidelity. After finding out about Shun's infidelity, Mari scolded him and broke up with him immediately. After graduating from university, Mari worked as a childcare worker at the Sakura Kindergarten. It was a job that gave her a sense of fulfillment. Surprisingly, the kindergarten was the one Asami went to when she was a child. It seems like there's some karmic cycle at play here. After starting work, Mari often met up with her three best friends. The three of them still celebrated her birthday. All four of them seemed very happy. But after that, something sad happened. The place was too crowded, so they decided to continue their conversation elsewhere. They ended up at Shun's karaoke bar. Luckily, Shun wasn't there or it would have been awkward. Asami asked what had happened. Mari said that Natsuki and Miho later died in a plane crash. For a long time, they couldn't get over their grief. Although the two of them occasionally went out for meals, they were never as happy as before. They promised to live on, including for the sake of Natsuki and Miho. Asami asked how old she was when she died in that life. Mari said she wasn't sure because she died at 62, and Asami lived longer than her. In Mari's second life, she started thinking about how to save Natsuki and Miho. She originally thought of preventing them from getting on the plane, but then she thought about the other passengers. If she knew how to fly a plane and could get on it, perhaps she could save everyone. So, to get her pilot's license, she started working hard from primary school, exercising every day, and slowly became the top student in her grade. However, she gradually drifted apart from her three friends. Asami asked her if this would really work. Mari said that since she knew in advance the flight route where the accident would occur, she could just change the flight route at that time. But what she didn't expect was that in this cycle, Asami died at the age of 33, and her death was related to her. It's revealed that the four friends were together that day. Because Mari held up Asami when she went to the restroom, Asami didn't have a car accident in the first cycle. But in the second cycle, Mari separated from their friends early to save Natsuki and Miho. Without her interference, Asami had a car accident. However, Asami said it was just a coincidence and had nothing to do with Mari's interference. But Mari said that because of her early death, she was overly grieved and her health suffered. She then failed to become a pilot and could not save Natsuki and Miho. She also died before the age of 40 in her second cycle. In the third cycle, Mari arrived at the supermarket early to prevent Asami from having another accident. This time, she saw Rina was also there, and Asami didn't have a car accident. But she didn't expect Asami to have a car accident a few months later. Although she later became a pilot, she found that pilots couldn't choose their own flights. As a result, she still couldn't save Natsuki and Miho in this cycle and died in a car accident herself. In the fourth cycle, Mari died before she even became a pilot. From the staff in charge of reincarnation, Mari learned that she and Asami was likely to die in their 30s. Then finally came the current cycle. Next year is the year when the plane crashes. Mari has made full preparations for this cycle and has a very good relationship with the scheduling staff. There should be no problem getting on the flight that will crash. Asami told her to be careful and asked if there was anything she could help with. Mari said she just needed to wait patiently and proposed to take a photo booth picture afterwards. But before that, she needed to go to the restroom. Asami sighed, saying she was still the same. In fact, Asami knew that Mari must have experienced unimaginable pain on her journey. The two of them happily took another photo booth picture. On the way back, Asami suggested trying to invite Natsuki and Miho out. After all, the four of them were originally a clique and would definitely get along well. Mari said it would be more meaningful to invite them after she safely landed the plane. Asami asked whether that meant waiting until next year. They decided to send the invitation when Asami came back next time. The two of them parted ways at the crossroads. Asami returned to her usual work routine. One day, she suddenly saw a piece of news on her phone. A plane had disappeared over the sea. 
She had a bad feeling and immediately dialed Mari's number, but it was unanswered. She was scared and didn't dare to think further. Until a few days later, this feeling became a reality. Asami and her classmates attended Mari, Natsuki, and Miho's funeral. They had planned to meet up with Natsuki and Miho just a few days ago, but the bad news came so suddenly. Afterward, they went to Shun's KTV bar. Everyone was still in grief, and no one spoke. Asami suddenly remembered what Mari had said last time, that the flight accident was next year. Now she realized that Mari had lied to her to prevent her from worrying. The three of them stayed until dawn. Walking on the familiar small road, memories of her three dead friends flooded her mind. Now she was the only one left, and a sense of desolation permeated her body. Now she understood Mari's feelings of losing her and Natsuki and Miho. To numb herself, she dove even more into her work. Three years later, Asami encountered a woman on her way home from work. The woman suddenly stopped her and asked which life cycle she was in. It turns out, the woman was Asami's co-worker named Hori, indicating she might also be a reincarnator. Asami asked her how she knew she was also a reincarnator. Hori said it was her eighth cycle, and in one of her cycles, Asami had suddenly disappeared. So she knew that Asami was just like her. She was surprised to have run into Asami by chance on the street. Apart from Mari, this was the second reincarnator Asami had met. So she invited Hori over to her house. Hori told her that all eight of her life cycles were identical. She hadn't intentionally changed anything. It was like playing a game, seeing whether she could live each cycle just like the previous ones. It was quite an interesting thing to do. Asami thought to herself how happy Hori's first life cycle must have been for her to have such an idea. At the age of 39, destiny finally favored Asami. As she was passing a construction site, a steel bar fell from above, causing her death. The staff told her she could reincarnate as a human this time. So Asami went to the door on the left, her first time going there. But after a thought, she turned back and asked the staff if she could still choose to start her life over. The staff told her it was possible, but this would be her last chance for reincarnation. He asked her if she really wanted to use it. Afterward, Asami, without any hesitation, went to the right and began her fifth life cycle. This time, her goal was no longer to accumulate good deeds in the afterlife, but to make her present life better and bring happiness to everyone. Regardless of the final outcome, she would never regret this life. After attending the entrance ceremony, Asami saw Mari coming out from another classroom in the corridor. Their eyes met, confirming their recognition. As a pilot this time, Asami took the initiative to find the captain, hoping to swap shifts with him. But the captain said this flight was also very important to him. If he didn't fly this time, his pilot qualification would expire. Asami and Mari quickly returned home to discuss strategies. Mari suggested they could poison the captain, disabling him from boarding the plane. But Asami argued that they would be investigated and possibly jailed. Having no choice, Asami once again approached the captain, pleading for a favor. But the captain remained firm. With no other option, they decided to drug him. They planned to have Mari distract the captain with a conversation in the pilot's lounge while Asami slipped the drug into his coffee. The drug would take effect within 30 minutes and last half a day. This way, Asami could take over the captain's pilot position. On the day of the incident, the two arrived at the airport lounge as planned. Asami probably never imagined that the medicine she had studied in previous lives would come into use here. While Asami was still thinking about how to clean up the mess afterwards, a voice interrupted her. It was Hori, who had lived through eight life cycles, whom she had met in the previous cycle. Asami was shocked. Hori said she was influenced by Asami in her last life and wanted to try changing her own life. As a result, she saw Asami's news in the paper this cycle and came to apply for a flight attendant job. But the assessment was strict, and she barely passed. She later found out that the same captain had helped her. Curious, she investigated the captain and discovered that he was supposed to take his mistress on vacation today. Hori, who was strongly opposed to infidelity in her last life, made an anonymous phone call to the captain's wife. So the captain canceled today's flight and was likely at home dealing with his wife. Soon, Asami received a call from the scheduling department asking her to serve as the new captain of today's Flight 937. Despite the ups and downs, Asami, bearing a sense of duty and mission, was about to board Flight 937 to save everyone. But a middle-aged man suddenly stopped her. Asami told him they were waiting for the flight and asked if they could talk another time. The man patted his briefcase, asking for just two minutes and warning not to provoke him. He mentioned that this was his second life cycle and that Flight 937, which they were about to board, would crash. 
He asked if they could change the flight path. In his previous life, he was planning to reconcile with his divorced wife, but she ended up on the doomed flight. So in this life, he had specifically investigated and found that the plane had hit falling space debris. It sounded absurd, but for the safety of all passengers, he pleaded with Asami and Mari to believe him. If they didn't, he would have to hijack them. Asami assured him they would change the flight path. Mari revealed this was her sixth life cycle, and Asami revealed it was her fifth. They both became pilots to save the people on Flight 937. This revelation surprised and delighted the man who thanked them profusely. Finally, they boarded the plane. Asami switched off the autopilot while Mari seized the opportunity to change the course. At last, their goal was achieved. They had waited more than 30 years for this day. They discussed their next lives, hoping to be born again in their hometown even if they weren't human. They spotted the falling space debris not too far away, a sight that filled them with excitement. Sometime later, the plane safely landed at the airport. As they exited the airport, they found Natsuki and Miho waiting for them at the elevator. Natsuki and Miho had learned about their identities as pilots from the plane's broadcast, so they were waiting especially for them. The duo probably didn't know they had just escaped a disaster on the plane. When they all went to dinner, they took out their old photo booth pictures, respectively. When placed together, it looked as though all four of them had taken the photo together. It was the happiest day of their 30-plus years. Their wishes were finally fulfilled. In the year that followed, Asami and Mari quit their job as pilots. After returning to her hometown, Asami found work as a government employee, just as she did in her first life cycle, living a 9-to-5 life. This time, she became more patient when dealing with citizens. Strangely, Hori also quit her job and started working in the same government department. Hori said she couldn't adapt to the flying lifestyle. It seemed like Hori was there specifically to save Asami. Mari also returned to her job at the kindergarten, just like in her first life cycle, becoming a child caretaker again. Now that they had both achieved their life goals, it seemed like everything had returned to the start. The four of them finally became close friends. When they had free time, they would go out for meals and gossip. Later, they went to a KTV bar owned by Shun, who had been promoted to manager. The four of them invited all their middle school classmates. It was their second reunion after their university gathering. Asami mentioned the last time Shun performed. Both she and Mari were there. Everyone felt sorry for Shun, but he himself didn't mind, knowing that he was definitely not a talent for singing. Natsuki said that even though Shun didn't have a talent for music, he had the ability to make people around him happy, and that was enough. At the bar, Shun sang a song for everyone. Asami noticed that Mari and Shizuka, two people who once had feelings for Shun, were now happily chatting together. The group of them had a great time. Fifty-eight years later, the four of them sat in levitating chairs, telling their life stories. They all had a happy and peaceful life in this cycle. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.